thing I will I will say to start with is we want this session to be as interactive as possible. So I'm going to ask you to contribute, whether that's uh, using the chat uh, or coming on camera and you know talking uh, as well works, um, you know as 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 required. So I'll give you a, a quick intro uh, to myself. Uh, I work as at Amazon. I'm a project manager. I, I work within our accounting team. Um, and so I, I do a lot of country launches. And so as of yesterday, my latest project launch, which was the launch of the Belgium website for Amazon, which is live. 24 hours ago. Um, so that's exciting. And so that's kind of like, you know, what I typically work on. I've been working with an actor students and in actors for a number of years now. I haven't counted, but I think it's seven, eight, maybe. So I've had the opportunity to work with a lot of an actor students. Uh, I've had the opportunity to judge at nationals, regional World Cup competitions and see some great social enterprise and projects uh, that have been run by students with the help of, of coaches and you know university advisors. So I really like the I really like the, the project. And what I would like to do today is to talk a little bit about why I think this is a great program from an employability uh, standpoint, because it really reinforces a lot of the things that companies are going to be looking for. Uh, when you apply for grad roles. And so I'll use, I'll use Amazon as an example because that's what I know best. I've worked at Amazon for 22 years now. Uh, and to put it into perspective, at the time when, when I joined, we only sold books, CDs, DVDs, and VHS tapes. So, so we've come a long way since, since that. Um, but um, I talked to you about what we call leadership principles and, and the way they work for us is we use those leadership principles to really create a sense of culture uh, within the company and to help people making decisions. Every single decision that is made within Amazon for the last 25 years is based on the usage of those leadership principles. Why this is important is because that's also the way we recruit. So when we recruit people, we're going to look at those values in people so that we know they're going to be a good fit for us as a company. So I'll share my screen so that you can see. Try to not. <laughs> cool. So here. Amazon leadership principles. So instead of me going through the leadership principles and what they are, what I would like you to do is to tell me what you think they are. Some of them are going to be pretty straightforward, some not as straightforward. So who wants to get us started? You can use eyes of a chat or come off microphone, assuming you have the, uh, the ability to do that. Um, and tell me, let's, let's take them in order. I think that would be more straightforward. Um, the first one is actually not our leadership principles, it's customer obsession. What do you think that means? And more than a definition, think about how you've seen customer obsession play out. Meeting customer needs, how do you do that? How do you ensure you meet customer needs? What sort of needs do we think customers have? You can type in the chat. Delivering products, yeah. Customer satisfaction. Putting yourself in the shoes of a customer is a good way to know or to actually try to understand what the customer needs. Deliver customer experience, cool. 
So customer obsession means really putting the customer first, right? Trying to think about what the customer needs, of course. And so if we think of, of Amazon, it's going to be things like, we know people are going to want to pay as little as they can for a product, right? So price is going to be pretty important. We know that people want to get their products fast, right? Uh, for the most part. So the convenience is also um, very important. And also you want to be able, whatever you find looking for good when you come on, on Amazon, right? So if you're not finding the products, that's a problem. So from a customer, you know, uh, satisfaction point of view, you're kind of looking at those three things for, for us specifically. But if you think about it a slightly different way, in terms of always putting the customer first, it's you're not satisfied with a product that you bought, you know, and you received yesterday uh, that you ordered on Amazon. You're going to get in touch with a customer service. From that point, if I'm the customer service associate, I know already what's going to be the best outcome for you. And typically it's going to be either you want your money back or you want a different product, assuming let's say it's broken or you know there's a problem with it. So it's always very easy to know what the customer wants in those very specific situation, right? So when we think about an actors, can anybody tell me in the context of an actors, who would be the customer? Who's our, who's our, I'm trying to not say the word, who's our customer in an actors? The students. I would say if you in actors UK, the students probably are your customers. Yeah. Partners. They could be, they could be stakeholders as well. Who is going to be impacted? by those projects. Clients, community, society, yes. So I think in an actors, you call them beneficiaries, right? So if you think of Amazon, when we look at customer obsession, for an actors, really, it would be beneficiary obsession, right? And so you do that by looking at who are the people you're trying to impact, you're trying to ask them questions. You're trying to you do a needs assessment so that you understand who your customer is. So you can see once you've whoop, jumped, jumped the page, uh, you can see when, let's say, three years down the road, you apply for a graduate role and you are able to talk about what you have done within an actors and how you've impacted your beneficiaries and how the most important people in your projects, whoever people you are impacting, that for somebody like me, I would be like, oh, this person is customer obsessed, right? So it is very important to, to recognize, you know, why you're doing the things you're doing and also keep that in mind. So for a company like Amazon, that's going to be key. All right, so let's move. I don't necessarily want to go through every single one of those, but one that I really like, uh, let's talk about, let's talk about learn and be curious. How do you, as students, I guess, how do you see learning and being curious play out? either in the con context of universities or in the context of an actors as well. What are some of the things you do consistently? You study, yes. So for you, that's almost your default mode. Learning and be curious is the primary <laughs> skill of students, right? Because you do a lot of research, you spending a lot of your time studying looking into things, digging. Um, and so to an extent, another leadership principle that we have, which is called dive deep, which is to go and investigate and gather data 
so we talked about beneficiary and needs assessment. So it's very similar. So between your learn and be curious and dive deep, you have a strong relationship between those two because they're both, you know, about, about research, right? So out of all of those other leadership principles, which one doesn't make sense to you or which one do you not have enough information to understand what it means? Bias fraction. So bias fraction is actually one that enactor students are very good at. Bias for action, I, I give you while the rest of the group thinks about what other leadership principles on this page, they don't necessarily understand. Um, but bias for action is basically the ability to go and do things. And one thing I've learned about enactor students is they excel at going and doing things, right? Because they're going to just get an ID and then straight away, they're going to just figure out how they make it happen, right? So they're going to basically really drive a lot of those projects by, you know, going and doing things, right? And so it's the ability of somebody to not just wait for things to happen, but to just go and see what they can do about those, those things. And so I think enactors is bias fraction is definitely one of the leadership principles that we have that we share in common with with an actors so the i write a lot thank you charlene for calling that one out it's not a very obvious one especially if you don't work at amazon um but what we mean by that is is that our our leaders tend to be right a lot and the way i think about it is if you do a lot of research, if you gather a lot of data and you make decisions based on that data, the chances you're going to be wrong is going to be much lower than if you just base your decision on instinct or you know situational drivers, right? So making decisions using data collecting that data, doing the research, means that you're going to make decisions that are going to be a lot stronger in general. And also, if you think about the way you make your decisions, if you know that you're always making decisions that are going to benefit your beneficiaries or your customer, the chances of you making the wrong decisions is also very low because you're always doing them in the right you know, mindset with the right ID. Right, and that's why we have that framework, so that regardless of how long you've been at Amazon or when you started, you can take that list and make decisions by just looking and combining those principles depending on the on the situation. Any other leadership principles that don't necessarily make sense to you on that list? Cool, no, that's a good question. We take any questions anytime, it's all good. Thank you, William. So it's a good question in the sense that, as you can see, with those leadership principles, they don't all go the same direction, right? And it's not so much as they create conflict, is that they can't always apply together on a situation, right? So i give you an example. You have a customer issue or customer impacting issue. You're selling products and there's a defect. Let's say you're selling washing machines and the, there's customer feedback that there is a defect with those machines and that you know there's electric fires and things like that. For something like this, speed is going to matter which means that a leadership principles like diving deep is going to be difficult to apply in such a situation because i don't have time to do a lot of research right i don't have time to gather a thousand 
responses to a survey to all the customers that bought that washing machine. I probably need to take it off the website. And then that's my first step, right? And then maybe just reach out to those customers and say, hey, there's a problem with this particular model. It was confirmed by the, the vendor. Maybe we need to talk to the vendor as well, right? So you can see that depending on the situation, some of those leadership principles are not going to be a preferred option, right? Which is why it's a framework. Um, and so, you know, um, the way the way I think about those is sometimes you have a choice, <laughs> right? Uh, of using more of a bias for action versus more of a deep dive. But sometimes you kind of need to also see what the situation requires. And so that's really where the, there's a little bit more to, um, you know, there's a bit more of a preference of the individual, but there's also kind of what the situation is. Abs, I think you have something to add to this. Yes, I think it's a really good question. Hey everyone, uh, I'm Abs from Prime Video. Um, I've seen quite a few examples where, as Fred mentioned, you sometimes have competing priorities. I think of all the principles, one of the sort of the real focus one is customer obsession. So I've been in a lot of internal conversations where people are having a debate and everyone's, you know, you still have your own teams, your own objectives. And someone will argue that, um, you know, invent and simplify is a lot more important in that moment than doing something quickly and, and vice versa. And ultimately, sometimes you have to take a step back and think, what is the best thing for the customer? Are we really doing something that's going to solve the cu customer problem? or add extra value to them. Um, and if we are, what's the best way we can do that? Um, if we think actually delaying a project will help us deliver for customers better um, and deliver a better experience, maybe that's the way we need to go. But if something's broken, a quick fix is really important so we don't impact more customers in a negative way. So uh, yeah, just wanted to, to share that as well. No, absolutely, yeah. And so, and the other thing worth mentioning is you don't always utilize every single leadership principle to solve an issue, right? It may be that bias for action and ownership is all it takes to solve, you know, a specific issue. You just identify the issue, you decide that, you know, you're going to own it and you're going to drive resolution. You're going to talk to all the people that you need to talk to, to, to come to a conclusion, propose a conclusion, and then, you know, maybe the problem is solved. And so an individual with those two leadership principles that's the main characteristic of how they draw it would be, would be the solution for those, right? But if it's something else, maybe deep dive is going to be, uh, is going to be, you know, the path we, we take. And then something like earn trust by the, just the nature of the, that, those two words takes time <laughs> to earn that trust, right? So it's not going to just be a, a, a one time that suddenly you can deploy on trust, right? It's more likely to be through continuous, you know, involvement with 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 your uh, you know stakeholders and the way you conduct yourself, you basically earning that trust, right? And so you know, there's there's a, a lot of nuances in all those leadership principles, but the good thing is. There's only a limited set of them. And so it's it's very easy to just keep within that framework, uh, you know, when we when we approach uh, situations. Cool. So we'll get back to the leadership principles in a minute. Um, but I just wanted to give maybe um, give maybe in terms of like the enactus life <laughs> uh the sort of experience that that you have right and so from what i've observed of, of an access project you you're always going to have like a financing budgeting uh kind of uh, aspect uh business modeling uh problem solving uh is always going to be predominant uh, because there's always going to be a problem Right, you're going to have beneficiaries, you're going to identify an issue. It could be local, it could be international, and you're going to just set out to solve it. So problem solving is 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 always uh, big. Depending on the project, you may have a product, 
right? Um, and so there's often going to be, you know, demos and prototypes uh, built for for some of the projects. Um, strong business uh, knowledge is built through uh, launching those projects. Um, management of stakeholders uh, is is a difficult skill in general. Um, whether at Enactus or, you know, uh, for me as a project manager. So the more you can, you know, practice management of stakeholders and stakeholders can be anybody that cares about that project. So for example, can you tell me for a typical project at Enactus, who are going to be the stakeholders? Who cares about that project? What do we think? Uh, hi, William. But I would think it would be the clients. That would be the stakeholders of interest. Cool. So when you say the clients, you mean the, the beneficiaries of the of a project? Yes, that's right. Cool, cool. Yes. So definitely they're going to care because they're the primary recipient of product or the solution. Who else? The investors. Yeah. So the investors could be could be the actors. Society uh, for your universities is they funding the, the project. Um, everyone that is impacted is the correct definition of a stakeholder. Um, and so, so we've had our beneficiaries. We obviously have our, our team members, right? They're obviously caring about the project. Uh, so you may have like a VP uh, or, um, you know, the directors from, from, from the enactors society, so they're obviously caring about specific projects. The dean of your university is most likely a stakeholder if you're doing things under the university name. Um, then your corporate sponsors, Enactus UK. So what you find is the, the list of your stakeholder is probably a minimum 10 to 15 people or groups of people for any project that you run. Right, it's not always just going to be you and the beneficiaries. Right, there's always going to be uh, a lot more, a lot more people. Soft skills. Uh, so soft skills is something that you know, whether we call it soft skills, whether we call it emotional intelligence. Uh, I see a lot of that practice in in a lot of the enactors projects uh, because there's a lot of communications happening. There's often beneficiaries uh, that have you know unique requirements. Uh, so we we need to uh, to obviously talk to them. Um, public speaking. Uh, some of you will be part of presentation teams, uh, but all of you will most likely have to talk about your projects, right? Whether that's you know internally uh, or to friends. And so the ability to be able to talk about what you're doing, uh, you know, in an articulate way is always a great practice. So next, I want to just show you something that you're probably familiar with, but if you're not, it's how you talk about your enactors experience, right? And I think it's useful to take uh, this um, star concept, which I'm sure you have covered or you will cover uh, as part of your studies, because for us at Amazon, that's the way when we think about you know, recruitment, we always try to shape things into that particular format. And we, we think about always, you know, what's the situation, right? Um, and then we'll talk more about the specifics of the task, right? Then actions, then outcomes or results, right? So always when you think about even writing about your projects, try to frame them in the star model is a good way to talk to people about what was the problem, you know, what did we do um, and actions and then basically results. Uh, is everyone familiar with the star model? Who hasn't heard of the star model before? First time, cool. So if you haven't heard of it, um, mm -hmm. do a, a quick Google search will definitely turn out uh, a lot of, of, of context on that, but it's a good model uh, because it will, it will allow you to talk about some of your experiences. 
Now, um, oh, I want you to go back. So we're back on the leadership principles. So there's something missing on that list. There are two leadership principles that are not <laughs> on that list. Um, so we're going to play a lead game. Uh, you're going to have to find me on LinkedIn and tag me in a post. You're going to tell me what's your favorite leadership principle is out of that list. And you're going to tell me one of the two leadership principles that's missing. What are they? Cool. So that's the that's the that's the little game we play we play online, um, and there's a reason for that, right? When we talk about employability, the more you can do upfront of you applying to a graduate role, the better. So that starts now, <laughs> and that means you documenting your journey on LinkedIn. And so what I mean by documenting your journey is if you are going to an employability week and you're not creating a post about what you've done or what you've learned in that week and sessions on LinkedIn, you're missing a trick. Because then two years from now, apart from you, nobody's going to know you've gone to that employability week. That that a fair assessment? You think two years from now? Like, I'm certainly not going to remember the names in the chat, right? Even though we've interacted. So unless you find a way to crystallize that interaction, right? I'll give you an example of how I think you should play this. We have William ask a question, right? And he asked about causing conflict, leadership principle causing conflicts. I would create a post and say, great conversation about, you know, leadership principles and, you know, conflicting with each, with each other, right? Uh, and just tag in actors, you know, great employability week, create a post. Doesn't need a picture, doesn't need anything, right? But creating that post now as creating a record of you being at this event. It is creating a relationship between you and me and an actors and Amazon that can't be erased, right? So it's very important. And I know I'm telling you, and only maybe 1% of you are going to actually go and do it, but you should take every opportunity to connect with the people you interact with that are already professionals so that myself, Abs, Charlie, and then actors, fellow students, right, counts as well. You should create those network as you go. Because we obviously don't know what the future holds. You may not be interested in working you know, at Amazon, and that's fine. But you will come across many companies, many people that you may want to work for, if not in as a graduate, maybe 10 years down the road, you don't know. So build it up and maybe that network will grow over time effortlessly if you focus just on the document, uh, documentation of the, of the journey aspect. Cool. So you obviously have my permission to connect on LinkedIn with me and we still have that little game of you creating a post, tag me, and telling me your favorite leadership principles, but also one of the two that we are missing. I haven't decided what the prize will be yet. <laughs> but yeah, make like Ab says, make sure you tag an Actors UK as well, right? So ideally you want to be making this a practice, right? I know it's going to feel uncomfortable for some, for some people, it will be natural. It will be just like posting on Twitter. They'll be like, yeah, what's the big deal? From some of you, I know you're going to feel like, oh, I'm going to sound silly. Like, forget about that. Just go ahead and do it and do it consistently. And 
you should document everything you do within your academic and in actor's life for sure right everything you do in actors you should basically document it as you go on linkedin and that means probably a minimum a post a a week or a day on linkedin to talk about what you're doing what are the challenges you're facing what are the things you're learning what are the open questions you have what help do you need once you've connected with me unless you're documenting on linkedin the challenges and the help you need i don't know about it but if you connected and then you have questions open questions on linkedin linkedin is most likely going to show me right i'll be like oh yeah this person like i remember they were at the employee week and we talked about leadership principles and they're working on this project let me see how i can help them if you don't do that in the open and linkedin is going to be the best platform then it's very difficult for people to help you okay does that make sense i'm expecting loads of connection on the on linkedin cool so i think charlie let's go to q and a's because that's probably the best thing to do now yeah for sure if you've got any questions for fred pop them in the chat or direct message them to me if you're really shy or if you're feeling brave uh, come off camera uh, come on camera i should say uh, and and ask a question um thanks so much fred abs has popped in the chat it's absolutely right make sure that enactus is mentioned on your profile there's nothing that kind of um gets to me more than than a student who will say oh i've applied for x job um and unfortunately i didn't make it through the interview or i didn't you know make it through a stage i said did you mention an actress on your cv did you mention an actress and they go oh no i didn't it's like oh my goodness me you've just heard from fred how valuable that experience at enactus can be as it's exactly what employers are looking for so you're massively missing a trick if you don't pop that on your cv uh, and uh, and mention it at interview um it really gives you all sorts of examples that you can kind of pick pretty much any one of those leadership principles and find examples that you can give using the star method, as Fred said, um, to really uh, emphasize that. Um, so yeah, any questions you've got around that or, or kind of anything at all, really uh, pop that into the chat uh, or come off mute and, and ask us directly. We're happy to answer any questions you have. William, a raised hand from you. Hi, uh, hi, Frederick. Hi. Um, after I've taken your advice on the LinkedIn, I haven't made my account yet, but I found the answer to what you were looking for. The, on the aspect that what was missing, would you like me to say it out here instead? Yeah, you can, uh, you can email oh. me as well. Is my, uh, is my email address. It, and is another way for you to reach out if you have any questions or if you need any help with anything. That's my work email address. Amazing. And uh, I've actually got a question. Um, mm -hmm. Is there any um, employ uh, employability opportunities for postgraduates to go for internships or like job scopes like that? There is. I don't know the specifics, uh, but I think all of those typically are going to be on our Amazon.jobs uh, site. Uh, so all the internships, all the graduate roles, uh, they tend to open at a specific time, like towards the end of the year. So probably about now, <laughs> uh, if they're not already closed. So I would say probably just check the um, Amazon.jobs site uh, for specific areas. Thank you, Abs. Amazing, thank you. Any other questions? Now would be a good time. Now's the time to ask. Don't be shy. Um, you only get this chance once. Um, something which um, uh, I kind of uh, would would love uh, kind of to see more from students is, is these opportunities to speak directly to uh, to people who work in the industry and have a lot of experience are few and far between uh, and kind of like don't be afraid like there's no there's no stupid questions just just put yourself out there and you never know what might come back uh, so please please go ahead and do ask ask a question um, it really uh, it really helps uh, uh, kind of like if you've got anything burning inside that other other students could benefit from the answer as well. Yeah, while, while people think about questions, um, so think about the questions, I would say if you 
and then use Amazon as an example, not because I want you to join Amazon, uh, but because <laughs> that's, that's easier for me to, to articulate. Um, if you think, let's say, if you were like starting at university and you have three years ahead of you before you even apply to graduate roles and you wanted to join Amazon, those leadership principles, you need to think about how you articulate your experiences as you go through your enactors uh, life and you work on projects to make examples and to see how you can fit them into those different leadership principles. So if you, for example, owning a specific projects, ownership would be a leadership principle that you could actually come up with example of how you've exemplified ownership. Bias for action, same thing. There was this situation where the team, you know, was stuck on the projects and I stepped up and I talked to the dean and I did this and did that. Document it, right, for yourself so that when you're going to find yourself, let's say, in an interview loop, you already talk the same language that we do. So I think it's easily done for Amazon. I'm sure you could find core values for just about any companies, <laughs> right, that you're interested in and go through your list of experience. I would say like the, the, if you can have like some sort of a journal that you document your journey, even for yourself, right, that you can refer to those, ex those experiences when you're preparing for an interview look three years from now, that's a, that's a worthy thing to do because if you're like me, I literally forget everything like four weeks out. <laughs> so, so if I haven't documented it, like even this conversation, I'm going to forget half of what I've said, right? In this, in this call, right? And that, if we did that employability session three months from now, I would literally do everything from scratch from the slides, right? And that may be a completely different session, right? So the more you can document, the more you can put things, you know, into writing, the better it's going to be for you when you want to write a CV or talk about your experience at Enactus. So we have a question from Bogdan. Importance of extra courses on LinkedIn profile. So what do we mean by extra courses, we think? You have an example of an extra course? I just want to make sure we answer stuff like you, Demi. Um, I think I think the jury is still out on that. It's going to be my uh, my view because it's really you shouldn't do training obviously for the sake of doing training. Training is only going to be valuable if you can use it, right? So I would I would say you better off taking training that you know you can use or benefit from in the context of your studies or your enactors. Uh, and if you, if there's a way for you to, I would almost think of it the other way, right? If I worked as a enactors project lead, does it make sense for me to take some sort of a certification about PMP or prints right, and use that experience to basically solidify that certification, right? That way you have both theory and practice. The training just on its own certification that's empty because you're not actually doing the job on using the principles, I would say I would stay clear of. Um, I don't know what companies look for and whether they completely ignore some of those because I think it's more about what you're doing than, than the degrees of the certifications you hold, ultimately. Yeah, I agree with that. I think it's a bonus, right? If I'm hiring someone for a marketing job and they happen to have done like a, a Google course in SEO, I, I look at it and think, oh, it's a bonus. It shows me they've done something else to build up their skills in that area. Um, but ultimately, the main part of the LinkedIn profile, or the CV, where you have your experience that's what i'm looking at right and you know so you're an apps experience for example should be in there with the key skills you demonstrated as part of that any part-time work or 
you know big projects you've done um, but i'm looking at that first um it's i think especially when you go in a, a graduate job or internship level it's going to be quite rare for a, someone hiring to look at the extra courses as a minimum requirement those are normally things that get more important if you're doing something very specialized um like i don't know forensic science and they need a specific qualification or if you want to become a project management director they would assume you have a you know pmp or a prince qualification um as part of that but uh, yeah it's a nice to have so if you've got those things great if they're relevant for what you're looking for highlight them on your profile for sure um but not a must-have yeah you know the, the one thing i would say is i like platforms like Udemy because it's a great way to get condensed, you know, informations about a specific topic. Now the quality of it is going to vary because there's just so many different offers, right? Uh, which is why I think ultimately most likely is going to be discarded by most people recruiting, uh, if I had to guess, uh, because it's just an it's not an official curriculum. Um, so yeah, that's, that's the way I think about it. And so we kind of answered a little bit of your question, Alicia, uh, on would you add an actor to the experience section uh, on LinkedIn? The way I think about an actors and the way you should document it is if you're working on a project, that project should have its own LinkedIn page because that project is now a company for whom you work for. And because you work for that company, that project, then you should document what you're doing within that company, right? What are the things you're working on? What are the, you know, the challenges, the impacts you're having? Uh, so the way you're going to document on LinkedIn is by creating content on a regular basis that is going to illustrate or validate what you ultimately going to write on your CV, right? When I go and read your CV and it says project manager for an actors on this project XX, I'm going to go to LinkedIn. I'm going to click on your profile and I'm going to scroll down to see if I can see anything about it. Because that's the only way I can validate it's true. I would treat an act experience like anything else, right? If you think about it, you're working on an actors for at least one academic year, that's, you know, it's basically like a job. Uh, so I think at this stage of careers, I would put it under experience, but you should write it in the same way. Like, you know, what are the key things you've delivered as part of that? What are the key skills just like you would with with the job? Um, that's certainly how I started doing it when, um, when I was an actor student. These days, if you go on my profile, um, I've shifted it down to volunteer experience because now I have loads of other work experience including with an Actors UK, um, filling that section. But it's it's kind of personal. And to you, I think the main thing is it should be in there and you should do it justice and call out, okay, great, so you did this, so what? What did you learn? What did you develop? What did you deliver? I think if you write it in that way, then I think to an employer, you know, it doesn't matter if, it, if you got paid for it or not. It's more about what did you learn from that? And they can look at that and think, right, this person has all these extra skills I'm looking for, um, for this grad scheme, this internship, for, for whatever it is. Yeah, absolutely. So we have a couple more questions. One from Daniel. Um, do referrals from LinkedIn connections really help students' applications for grad schemes and jobs? Connections on LinkedIn are, are people, <laughs> right? So if you know people, right, or if you're connected to people, it's always going to be an easier conversation, right? Let's say you reach out to me three years from now and we have first connection. I know we've interacted, right, already by the fact that that connection exists. And so you're already a step up to anybody else that would reach out and say, hey, you know, I'm interested in the job, right? And so uh, I would say it, it matters the same way it, it's always mattered uh that you know you have a network right what linkedin does it's create like a very easy way to maintain that network even though we may not interact for three years right because linkedin is going to tell me hey it's daniel's birthday in two weeks time <laughs> i'll be like who's daniel right but like you know what i mean like 
it's like now you're just not a stranger, right? And if that connection doesn't exist, it's just very hard, right? Uh, to keep to keep track of everyone. So I would say 100% connections uh, matter, uh, and those referrals are going to matter because you know depending on the companies, they may have already a fast track program where they can just feed in names. That means you three steps ahead. Right? Not all companies are going to have those, but if they do, then that connection and that referrals definitely matters a lot. Then Kiran, uh, what courses can help us to get a job at Amazon without any previous experience? I think Amazon is always going to look at those leadership principles. That's the way we recruit ultimately. So. If you want to get a grad job at Amazon, I would say start working with us now. You're part of an actus or you just signed up. We're going to be here, Abs and I, <laughs> right? Working on projects for the next three years or two years or however long you have left in, in an actus. Just make sure that you know you ask us questions, you interact with as many people, you make connections. You know, we can we can provide guidance on what type of roles are you interested. In. We're going to be available for it, right? So for me, that's the best approach is to know exactly how to prepare, how to interact. The more time you spend with us, the more you will know how we work, right? And once you know how we work, you you're going to have a better chance to align and decide do you even want to work here right do you align with the you know the way we approach things uh i think the answer would be yes right but uh but you know i think i think stay close to stay close to enactors and interact i think is the best is the best way and interaction is very simple you can reply to our post you can tag us when you have questions you know it's it's really not rocket science you just have to be consistent at it. It's definitely something I've tried to do because uh, before I joined Amazon, I spoke to Fred and uh, other Amazon coaches to try and understand what is the company like. Because uh, we're huge, right? And we have so many different businesses, um, you know, AWS, Prime Video, retail, shipping, and, and many other things. So there isn't like a one silver bullet. You do this course, you're going to get into Amazon. It's it's still, you know, a huge company. Those leadership principles, Fred's mentioned um those values and those things we follow are what we look for across candidates. And then it also depends on the function, right? So if you're looking for a marketing role or a sales role, what, what do you have that's relevant and transferable for that job? Um, but yeah, the more connections you make, more people you can speak to, I think it helps you understand better. And it might also help you understand whether you want to go into something. Uh, you might find that, you know, sales is an example. Um, at one point, I was really interested in business development, learn more about it, and it, I do not like it at all. But account management is a different part of sales with a very different focus and that stuff I do enjoy. Yeah. So what are the most required sectors in Amazon now? Um, so I'm assuming what you're asking is where are we recruiting the most? And I'd have to say, I don't know um, the answer, at least for the last couple of years. <laughs> which sectors uh, we've recruited. Uh, traditionally, I think AWS, AWS you know, has been growing you know, a, a lot. So there's definitely a lot of tech uh, work, I would say. Um, yeah, I don't- I can I jump don't... in on that. There's, there's quite a few, I mean, obviously it varies all the time. Um, I think within the retail business, particularly during COVID over the last couple of years, we have hired a lot in retail. Um, there's a role called brand specialist, which is part of like our e-commerce grad program. So that's very broad. That's normally a very standard entry point for a lot of graduates interested in joining Amazon. Um, so that's quite popular. There's usually roles in that every year, but the number of obviously varies with demand. Um, ADW, I think, continues to be one of those high growth areas, as Fred mentioned. Um, there are also tends to be with a company like Amazon, a lot of engineering and software development roles as well because that's very specific it's in high demand across the world for many companies so um 
that's obviously areas where if you're doing those kind of courses and things, um, there's lots of roles there. Um, and then uh, we have done a lot of movement as well, which not probably is not as relevant for you guys, but in apprenticeships. So Amazon have had a lot more apprentices in the last couple of years across many more functions. So it's an alternative entry point. Um, uh, again, you guys are doing degrees, so probably not the one for you right now. Uh, but that's where we've seen we've seen growth. Yeah, absolutely. And I think you know overall, I think you it's probably a good idea to keep tab on what's happening in the various industries. So I think areas like blockchain technologies and you know web free overall is something you need to be aware of like i can't ignore it <laughs> and i'm 47 so you can definitely not ignore it uh so so i would say you know definitely do your research and keep an eye on on new technology and what may impact you know various industries uh you know down the road right i'm just going to jump to the next one so i think I think we're missing the the two new LPs on your list, aren't we? Which I think will answer the sustainability question. Um, yes. So in the last two years, maybe even less, um, we have actually added two more leadership principles. Um, uh, all, all very good, important ones. So one is striving to be Earth's best employer. Um, people is a really, really important part of Amazon and what we do to make sure that we have productive, high-performing and really diverse people in the business with a diverse mix of ideas um, so you can have fun and and do a great job and learn so that's a new principle we've added and the second one um, which links to the sustainability questions is it's literally called success and scale bring broad responsibility and I think this is something we've been doing at Amazon for a while but we really wanted to put it more explicitly as part of our approach um, and that's we recognize we are big we impact the world we are far from perfect and you know there's a lot of change and a lot of responsibility we have to local communities and the planet so how can we bear that in mind when we're building our business when we're serving our customers how can we do better to help them and you know you might see that in things like you know we've changed most of our packaging now to be made from cardboard completely and ditched a lot of the plastic for stuff that we deliver directly through Alexa devices, we are able to reach people who might have vision impairments and help them find a different way to order food and shopping and things. So that's just kind of an example of how sustainability has become a key leadership principle within, within that new one. How are you talking to? I see a few more questions flying in, but I think they're... Yeah, I'm sorry to interrupt the session, uh, but unfortunately we are out of time. Um, thank you so much, uh, Fred and Abs, for, for that this afternoon. I think it's so, so valuable, as I said earlier on, um, to really highlight how that uh, how your experience at Enactus does uh, massively benefit you in terms of your employability, personal and professional development. And as Fred said, how important it is to make that easy for employers and everyone really to see that and see that connection and see your experience. Um, so I wanna say a massive thank you to all the students who joined the uh, call this afternoon. Um, you've, you've thrown some great questions, uh, uh, great questions at Fred and Abs. Uh, and thank you also to, uh, to Fred uh, and Abs, of course, uh, for answering them uh, and doing such a great job uh, uh, connecting that link between, uh, drawing that, uh, that line between Enactus uh, and, and leadership principles. Um, uh, fantastic session. Thank you very much. So that about does it for today. Um, we've got one more session following this one in Employability Week. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing you on that in just, just under half an hour's time. Uh, so uh, for me, it's goodbye and take care. Enjoy the rest of your day. Goodbye, everybody. Have a great day. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Bye.